Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today, The Future of Fan Personalization with John Flynn. My name is Jenna Bonifant. I work at EngageRM as a pre-sales engineer, um, and I will be introducing John today. I would like to introduce our speaker today, John Flynn. John is the director of sports at Microsoft, where he helps sports organizations modernize their business and elevate their game. John is also the founder and host of Azure for Sports podcast. We are very honored to have John joining us today. And with that, I will hand it over to John, who will now share his screen. Awesome. Thanks, Jenna. And thank you very much to the uh, Engage RM team for trusting me to, uh, to uh, handle an open mic. <laughs> That's hopefully it goes well. So thank you for everyone who's who's joining in. Hopefully uh, some of you uh, that are with us that are already clients of ours and those that aren't, hopefully we get to uh, bring you into the family soon. So like Jenna said, I'm director of sports at Microsoft. Um, so what that means in reality is, is I take care of the cloud business for our sports business here at Microsoft. Um, and we run the full gamut of, so, of, of looking after our sports customers from the fan side to the, the business side and then through to the actual sports side. Um, and we manage to use our first party um, Azure resources as well as third party um, resources on our Azure cloud to provide things such as fan engagement, we'll speak about that today, to provide things such as um, deep analytics into uh, how that goes into fan engagement, how that goes into running a sports organization, how that goes into player health and safety, for example. Um, I call New York home, wintry, cold, snowy New York at the moment. You probably guess that I don't have a typical thick New York accent because I'm from South Africa. Um, so being from South Africa, I have to stop right now and say this is day 1,555 of the South African rugby team, the Springboks being the world champions, thanks to their back-to-back -back win. So Sia and the lads, thank you very much. That's amazing. I do consider myself an honorary Springbok, although they know nothing about that. Um, I'm also a first-time author, right? I've never written a book before, but my good friends at Wiley saw fit to uh, publish a, a work of mine. It will be out on April of this year called Sports and technology have the power to change the world. Um, this is a riff off of a speech given by the immensely great Nelson Mandela um, when he was at the Laureus Sport for Good Foundation inaugural keynote um, where he said sport has the power to change the world. I unashamedly ripped that off from him and used that as the book, to, uh, I used the title of my book, um, and I really live and breathe this book as a job and I kind of get to pinch myself for it because I get to work with technology which is my passion I get to work with sports which is my ultimate passion um I'm also the host of the Azure for Sports podcast as Jen has said earlier so feel free to subscribe to it we're on all the usual channels drop me a line drop me a note if you want to be on the show drop me a line if there's anything you want to see or any questions or topics that you want us to uh, uh, uh uncover on the podcast feel free and like I said, I'm a professional sports fan, right? I would love to be uh, suiting up on the field with my beloved Springboks, but alas, I was far better in the stands. Um, and uh, I realized uh, quickly that I couldn't spend my entire life on a surfboard because uh, legends like Sean Thompson had already taken the goal uh, from me and, and are running with that uh, currently. So uh, again, thank you for being uh, here. And thank you for spending a little bit of time with us today. Um, we're talking about the generational divide in sports. Um, and I think divide might be a little bit too much of a strong word. Maybe I should have said, instead of divide, we can say segment, right? So essentially, we look at sports, we've broken it down into four segments in terms of who the fans are. So when we talk about fan personalization and how data, real-time data analytics can, can help a fan, there's really four versions. And four versions make up that ecosphere of, of a fan. First one is our Gen Z. Right. This is a these are think about it. The Gen Z's have never grown up without the Internet. Right. That's a fascinating thought. Like my kids are very much Gen Z's and they talk and they think about sports and consuming sports in a way different fashion than I ever had when I was their age. Simply the Internet is the is the is the differentiator there. It is absolutely crazy. So they make up about 25 percent of our global population, the 11 to 26 age group. Um, they very, very much are social beings. That doesn't mean they don't go to sporting events live, but they are very much a social being in that they will always have one of these things with them at all times. 
They prefer streaming content on their terms in terms of sports content that they want to watch, whether that's on social, whether that's on a streaming platform, whether it's on both. Right? They're a heavy, heavy use of social media because it is an inclusive medium to them. They are the quintessential multitaskers, which means they could be watching an event, streaming on a, on a platform, on a TV, on a laptop, on a on tablet, or at a live event, but they will still be engaged with their phones or their devices, not at the expense of anything else. It, it's unlike anything I've ever seen. I'm an old man, right? But they can watch a game and interact with the game at the same time and miss neither medium's delivery of whatever that content is. It's absolutely brilliant. The fun thing is, is that the study done by Deloitte shows that over 60% of these fans classify themselves as a Uber fan, which is a seven out of 10 or higher. Um, it could be towards the latter of this group. They don't break it down in terms of who the age group is. But as we get into the latter part of this group, disposable income comes in because people are, are aging out of school and getting into, into jobs or into paying careers. Um, and they're super sharp when it comes to sport. Right. They know their players. They know their teams. They know their stats and they love immersive content as well. So they're the ones who put on the goggles. We may think of goggles. I actually think of goggles as a as a very inclusive or exclusive event. Right. I mean, it's just me. But for our Gen Z, it's very inclusive because they get to hang out with the digital version of themselves. So they're imprinting on all the digital version. They're seeing all their friends and they're seeing all ways to interact and there's data everywhere. It's great for them. And then augmented reality as well. Let me move on to millennials. They are the digital physical fan, right? So they are extremely, extremely digital oriented, but also like a physical touch, also like something that is tangible for them themselves. They are the 27 to 42 year old um, age group. They make up 23% of the global population. So if you think about it, between these two groups, there's about 50% of the global population that erring on the side of digital as being super friendly to them. Again, they're engaged extremely deeply with streaming services, right? You'll see the theme between these two groups. And they're willing to pay for a unified streaming experience. And this doesn't mean that they want all their content on one platform. It means that when they get their content that they're willing to pay for multiple times over, they want the medium to be normalized. So they want to be able to log on to it in the same fashion. They want to be able to understand if I can have a screen Overlay on this service, I should have it on this service. They're looking for that uniform experience across all of their services, and they will pay handsomely for that. They're also likely to be multitasking, caveat being at home for some reason. So if they're at home, typically they'll either be in the cook in the kitchen doing some uh, cooking, or they'll be in the garage doing some tinkering around, or actually doing work while they're engaged with some sporting content as well because they're in command of when they're listening and when they're watching and when they're consuming that sport content. And they also, out of every group that we have, they have the most varied taste. So not only do they enjoy the live action that's happening now, they're the highest consumer of replays. So in the morning on the train or the evening on the, on the treadmill or whatever fashion or time you want, they'll look at these um, automated um, um, I have a low battery, apparently. They have these um, automated highlight reels come out and they'll voraciously consume these. Um, they also love sports documentaries. They love getting into the story behind the sport. They love understanding why something was done or why there was a, a sudden rush of fans or why did they win last year and they absolutely know it this year. They love to uncover the deep uh, reasonings behind the fans, uh, behind the sports that they love. Then we have Gen X. Now, Gen X is the most balanced, we would say, of the fans out there in terms of the digital and physical divide. Um, they make up 19% of the population, 43 to 58 years old. Um, they are extremely tech savvy. If you think about where we are today and the age group that it's in, they've grown up with tech as likely a cornerstone of their career. So they're very used to engaging with the technology medium, very used to conversing in a digital medium. And quite frankly, due to the pandemic that we had, everyone's kind of used to now having a digital version of themselves and interacting with another, another digital version of themselves. The truth is though, they prefer traditional sports experiences. They, to, they, they prefer to be in the zone if, for example, if I sit down and I have a linear program, a linear broadcast, they'll sit down and watch it. But they do like to have a second screen experience. They like to go, okay, well, let me find out why something is happening there. But they're not as distracted as they are 
from the millennial group where they need to be engaged on social and certainly not as distracted as the Gen Zs who want that digital part as part of that traditional broadcast. Um, they're the most loyal group of fans that we have. They will stay loyal to a team, but they will also stay loyal to a player and follow that player around. So if a player moves from team to team to team, they will move from team to team to team and vote with their wallet, uh, wallets on tickets, vote with their wallets on merchandise, et cetera, as that team player is with another team. And they're willing to pay for an experience. So, for example, there was an uproar, right? Bands, the Kansas City playoff game um, was only streamed on Peacock a couple of days ago. And if you didn't have Peacock, you couldn't watch it. Right? First time ever. And, uh, that Peacock bid on it from the NFL. They won it, and that was that. Gen X doesn't mind paying for it because they're getting an experience that, that is valuable to them. They don't mind going and now having a Prime subscription because they know Thursday Night Football, only way I can get that is if I want that, I have to have the subscription. They don't mind because the value is there for them. So they will happily spend to get the content or access rather to the content that they want. And then finally, we have the boomers. Right, so these are the traditional ones. These are, are uh, as my, my kids call me, boomer, whether that's true or not, I'll, I'll let you guys decide on that, right? But these are the ones, that, the conventional viewers, right? These are the ones that have 60 plus years old. Um, so hopefully you make the right decision of whether I'm a boomer or not. And they make up 14% of the global population uh, today. And they prefer living in the now. They prefer to consume sports content as it's been traditionally delivered. They prefer to be at the games. They prefer to hear, smell, taste, feel the sporting event in front of them. They're not likely to be on their phones. They're not likely to be engaging in any social media while a game is being played. Not saying the boomers aren't tech savvy, certainly not. Not saying the boomers aren't socially adept at social media and being in a digital form. But as far as it comes to sports, this is my thing. I'm sitting down and I'm watching sport, whether it's at home, whether it's in the in the uh, in the stadium. This is what I'm doing. Live in the now. So, how do we market to them? How do we understand now? There's four different groups. Okay, fair enough. But does that mean I have to have four different fan engagement strategies? Well, not quite. Right? We can't really look at marketing to one group at the expense of the other or favoring one over another group because there's certain nuances even within groups where who's spending the revenue, who's spending the revenue where, is someone in the venue or someone out of the venue, is it ticketing, is it merchandise, is it streaming services, or is it partner business? There's a whole bunch of nuances that go along with that. And how we draw our conclusions as to what looks good is really through data. And more importantly, through real-time data. So how do we know how that fan is, is interacting with our brand, with our product at that moment in time so we can either course correct or we can take a continued approach or just completely change what we're doing because it isn't being picked up, isn't working. So we generally like to say, meet the fan where they are. For our Gen Zs, the immersive and interactive digital experiences reign king, right? The VR stuff, offering experiences through VR when you put on the goggles, again, for a Gen Z fan, is a very inclusive event because they get a digital stage of which they can play on, digital world to immerse themselves in. NBA VR, huge success with the Gen Z market. Absolutely brilliant. They also like AI-powered social media tools. Now, what I mean by that is if I am interacting with you on a social channel, interact back with me. right? And we use AI tools and, more importantly, generative AI tools to send a response back to me to some first party data that I've given to you. Maybe I'm interacting via a hashtag. Maybe I'm interacting via an ad sign or on a channel that is run by X sport team. I can get back to that fan using generative AI, which scales my ability to use communication at machine speed back to my fan. Makes the Gen Z feel very much included in that sports team. They talk back to them immediately. They talk to them where they are versus, oh, I'll send you a, a tweet or I'll send you a, 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 a comment on your TikTok video and you email me back. That's a miss. It doesn't work. They don't pick up on that, right? If you get back to them on the medium they're using in the now, you've got their loyalty. You've got their fandom. Millennials, 
all about personalized content delivery. And that this is where you're going to start to see the bleed, where we have the overlap. If you use that same premise of getting back to me, how I'm communicating in with you, that's personalized to me. I feel special. I feel like you're listening to me. Therefore, I'm going to keep communicating with you because it feels good. I'm no longer waiting for an email or a drip campaign or something I can, a friend can tell me, or I have to go to Google and search something. No, I'm, I'm asking the question and I'm getting it back. And they love the ability to get enhanced game analytics. So this is where that real, that second screen um, paradigm comes in. Because when I'm watching someone, I can go in, well, when's the last time that ball flew over the right side um, of the stadium? Because that outfield is long, man. Who, who is the last one to hit that out there? What's the furthest one? Oh, that's cool. And then it also lends in a little bit of light. If I, if I have a proclivity in a state that's allowed in the United States to do some sports betting, the deep analytics is going to allow me to then to get into the realm of, of making a decision on a sporting sport betting event or not. <clears throat> and we talk about Gen X. We're getting upwards in terms of the, the uh, age groups that we're talking about. They're the ones who like to have smart stadiums. Right? Remember, these are extremely tech savvy. They've grown up with tech. The tech is a large cornerstone of the career. When they go to a stadium, they want it to be cutting edge. They want state-of-the-art stuff. They want to be able to sit in the seat. And if I'm using the app, bring me some food and beverage because I've ordered it on my app. I've got some loyalty points. I've been delivered an offer. This is absolutely brilliant. Bleeding over again, second screen experiences. I'm sitting in my, in my seat. Or I'm standing in my, my standing position on one of the viewing decks. I can order food. I can order merchandise right to here so I don't miss any of the action. I'm interested in the second screen stuff, but now I can get things popping up to me because I have allowed you access to my data because I'm getting something in value back. You know where I am because you've geotagged me or you have my ticketing data and you registered me as being in the venue. Um, you know where I am in the stadium because we have Beacon Technology and I've opted into allowing you that so I can get my food and beverage or my merchandise delivered. Now you can start talking to me based on where I am, based on where we are in the game, based on who my favorite player is that may not be playing. So am I a flight risk? Am I going to leave early before I've, re before I've converted as much revenue as I potentially could be? How do you keep me engaged? You've got my attention here, and you've got my attention based on where I am in the stadium. And then moving to the baby, baby boomers, um, again, live in the now. They love to be in the, the seats, they love to be in the thick of the action here. But again, they want to have AI enhanced game experiences. So that could mean something as, 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 as easy as going, I have a ticket that's on my phone. Again, the tech savvy, they're not adverse to tech at all. It tells me which gate to go in. And when I'm in that gate, it tells me if I can go up stairwell X, or if I'm not able to do stairs, there's a ramp over here, or there's an elevator over here. Or if you'd like any um, accessibility services, go through this gate and we can help you with a concierge desk there to get you to your seat. And then we can come get you from your seat and we can show you where the closest bathroom is. Again, all of these things are enhancing their game, their game day experience for them in the stands. So their preference for convenience far outweighs anything else. They'll be in the game. They love it, this action. But if it is inconvenient for them, they won't They won't buy another ticket. They won't come again. They may, they're more often than not, these last two um, categories are season ticket holders. They'll likely sell their season ticket holders or even worse, their second ticket, say season ticket holders that just don't show up as an empty seat. And that, for the boomer, is really all about convenience. So as you can see, across the swath of the four groups that we've identified. Um, and you'll see some flipping in and out as you get to the, the age bracket sort of um, cusp of the relationship where am I, I'm turning from a, a Gen X into a boomer, right? You'll see some spill over there, but there are common threads throughout um, your fan engagement. And that is the data. And that is the real-time data based on where I am now, how do I interact with you now? And how am I interacting back with you? So it's easy for me as a Gen Z or a millennial to, sh to show you how I'm interacting back with you because it's, it's a digital imprint back to you. It's first party data I'm generating back to you. Sometimes in the stadium, it's a little difficult for the Gen X and for the boomers in order to put a digital um, imprint back to you because they may not be using it. There, they're voting with their wallets. 
they bought another ticket, they came back, you you had a convenience-based um, solution for them. If you're a boomer or you provided a smart stadium experience that they came back. I mean, look at the stadiums now that have um, um, look, they have automated beer delivery, right? So you'll go up um, and you'll you, you, your face is scanned or you put your ID onto a scan and it'll open up the thing with the beer that you can get out. You haven't spoken to a person yet, you can get back to your seat straight away. That's cool. I'll definitely go back to that stadium. That's how people are activating and voting there. Again, using data to further the uh, further the uh, engagement that you have with your fans. So the sports and analytics um, analytics market is, is growing rapidly, that's to say the least. And we've seen a hockey stick. Over the last five years, we've seen the growth, more growth after, uh, over the last five years than we had over the previous 20 years in terms of uptick of data and analytics as a tool used by sports organizations to speak to their fans. For example, the market was valued about $2.1 billion in 2020, right? Almost an order of magnitude growth in 10 years, just over 16 billion with a B in 2030 is the projection of how just the just the, the, the sports data and analytics market is going uh, to grow to. And that, I mean, going from single digit to double digit billions is just absolutely astonishing. And the beautiful thing about data is that the more real-time capabilities that these teams and these organizations and the aggregators put forward, um, the more uptick we get in terms of the, the data that we create. More data creates more data. Now, typically, this has been, it has been around for a long time, but it's kind of been reserved for the player side of the house, for the performance, the team strategy, the, the training, for example, um, we've seen that we, we use biometric uh, data capture and we do um, data crunching through predictive injury models and we do data capture that shows this is the practice that we train to, this is how it actually appeared in the game, where are the overlays, where did we go, is it a training problem, is it a, an actual play problem, did, the, did we not see it correctly, for example, um, and that's been around for a long time, ton of data, ton of data crunching, now the fan has been afforded that luxury. Now, the fan is being looked at as one of the key players on the team, because without us, there is no team, right? Because you can't pay the coaches these amount, this amount of money that you're paying them, the players this amount of money that you're paying them, just from rights deals alone, just from sponsorship opportunities alone. You need the fans who create value in rights deals. You need the fans who create those extra zeros in sponsorship deals because we buy tickets because we interact with the brand, because we give that brand life. I don't know if you've ever been to an empty stadium. Um, it, it, it is marvelous to see at first and you, wow, you look around, it's great. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, what now? What? There's no one there, there's no action, there's no life. You get a sports team in there and you get every seat filled in there. It, it's, a, it's just a marvelous experience. Without everyone in there, it's just a bunch of people hitting the ball or kicking the ball around on the field. It loses its luster. It loses its magic. And I think the fan has now been ascended to its rightful place as being part of the team. So <clears throat> the more experience that we gain from putting these first party, um, uh, putting these real time data solutions in place, the more first party data we get. Now, first party data is absolute gold, right? That's me in my voice that I'm giving to you in exchange for something of value. Um, and, and AI has, has dramatically increased the pace in which we're collecting first party data, um, especially in the fact that I can write a question to get an answer right back. That question is my voice, that prompt that I put in that you're collecting from me that I'm allowing you to because I'm interacting with your AI tools is data you would get from nowhere else. Not even the data aggregators, the, the partners that you have in maybe travel or credit card or whoever it is can give you that level of granularity for me. And now the new rules where they're doing away with cookies, right? Those little cookie trails that we have in the web, those are going to go away. So first party data becomes increasingly more important. How do I know how to talk to my fans? Well, you need to know your fans. How do you know your friends? Talk to them. Have them talk back to you, right? And now what we're able to do is that we can analyze deep, deep analysis around purchasing patterns, the demographics that we have, but not only here, but follow them around when the team travels. Does someone travel with the team? That's amazing. There's another data point. Um, we can, they, they're able then, the teams are able to tailor marketing strategies that hit that player. 
So we've gone, if you, if you see where the trail is going, we've gone from having the four segments and we'll have a marketing approach to each one of those segments where it's far better than just having one. Now we're getting down to the individual level, right? And we will get there. And part of that growth to 2030 when the market becomes over $16 billion in value, part of that is driving that individual fan marketing approach that we will ultimately get to. And segments will become a segment of one. And segments of one will like to be put together with each other because humans are social beings. And you can see some of the classifications from above. Those lessons will um, stay true in that they would like to be lumped together and stick together. So <clears throat> hopefully this sounds good. Hopefully you're all with me. I can't see anything, but hopefully you're still there and no one's falling asleep. But who's using it today? Where is this being used in practice today? So we have an MLB team. An MLB team had a had an idea that they wanted to target growth in their millennial segment um, and more specifically the millennial streaming segment because they'd released a streaming product um, and it didn't have much uplift on it. they'd released a uh, a new marketing a new flashy uh marketing campaign and it hit really well with gen x but gen x again is only 19 percent of the population Millennials are 24% of the population, so they wanted to they wanted to hit this other group. So we we worked together first and third party services here is that we drove a hyper personalization approach, getting to that segment of one, using real time data from from various sources. They have their CRM CRM data, um, they have ticketing data, there's loyalty programs, and there's various bits and pieces of partner data as well, stadium data, food and beverage. The list can literally go on if you partner with your fanatics, if you partner with XYZ. Um, and they also use social media, as a little bit that I mentioned before, to have a one-to-one -one relationship with someone. If I'm interacting with your brand, and it could be positive, neutral, or negative, right? We'll run sentiment analysis across this, and we found the ability to find a negative fan, but still has the time to sit and complain about you, is a really good latent fan. Because if you have the opportunity to communicate with them and get them into a good fan category, You've got them for life. Their loyalty shoots through the roof. It's all of a sudden, oh, my team sucks. My team's this. And then all of a sudden, they start interacting with me. It's like, all right, my team doesn't suck. My team listens to me. My team knows me. Yeah, they lost. Meh. Better luck next time. But look, they just spoke to me again. It's brilliant. You're part of the family, right? Your, your fan has now been elevated to a member of the team. So we developed also a real time loyalty program. Now, using fan purchasing um, behavior, we're able to offer predictive um, um, offers for in the in the venue, as I spoke to, if you're opting into your booth, into your beacons and your, your ticketing data to get in there. But also for those streaming at home, I may not know you're streaming on your login because you may be at a friend's house or you may be at a watch party, but you're interacting with the brand based on the hashtags that we've created for that moment. Or you're interacting with the brand on the day and the time where the game is happening. So now I know that you're interacting in some form. You may be streaming it. You may be looking at it on, on social media. You may be getting text-based updates because you're on a plane. I don't know that just yet, but I can send you an offer. And if you activate on that offer, it may be a bunch of partners offers, but if you activate on that offer, I know that you're listening to me and you're talking back to me. So I've opened the door and I can have the right to then reward you for that. And this is that activity-based loyalty program that we have. So the results are actually brilliant, right? And 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 full disclosure, they they far exceeded a lot of what the original KPIs that we had hoped for. Um, the increased ticketing sales jumped 15%, right? In the millennial group, remember, we're just talking about millennial group as compared to the 22 season. Now, um, this is we had hoped for about a third of that, to be honest with you. Um, but the the resulting offers in stadium really drove value um, to this group of, of individuals. The merchandise was higher as well, right? So merchandise um, sales went up about about ten percent in stadium. And now remember, this is in stadium premier merchandise at premier prices. You know, the discount stores, that not at the Amazon.com, whatever it is. They're, they're in the moment paying a great deal of money to have a new jersey or a hat or a scarf or whatever it may be. Um, <clears throat> and with these enhanced metrics that we got around behavior, how we're interacting with the brand, who's interacting with the brand, they were able to increase their value in their sponsorship dollars by 
So that means they were able to attract different sponsors who were willing to pay a higher premium for the same white space that they would have on the app or the same white space that they would have around the stadium because they could talk to who the fan is from a very tight demographic group, from a very tight potential revenue conversion group as it pertains to that sponsor that they weren't able to before. And the most staggering thing that I took away from this is that their ROI calculation over a course of a year was four to one. Right. So that means that every dollar that they spent, they claim back four dollars in revenue across this group from ticketing sales increases, from merchandise increases and sponsorship increases as well. Um, and another statistic which was absolutely staggering to me um, was that in, as a result of this um, work that we did together, the increased engagement that they saw from the fan loyalty resulted in what they is estimated as a 30% estimated lifetime value increase of that millennial fan because they've got the millennials leading into the next segment, into the next segment. So a, a raging success um, for this MLB team and for us. Another example is the NFL. <clears throat> now, the NFL wanted to increase the Gen Z streaming revenue. Right. So how do we increase the Gen Z streaming revenue? So if you remember back to how the, the Gen Zs like to interact with the sports content that they're looking at, it is a very, very interactive sport. It's almost like a full contact sport with I'm going to tell you something, you tell me something, and I'm going to interact with it. It gets kind of crazy at times. Right. But what they did, they overlaid um, deep, rich statistics based on your login based on how you had behaved with, how you had interacted with the um, with the team and the analytics offerings that they had on a previous day. So when you first came in, you would have some generic uh, second screen opportunities. The more you interacted with it, they'd offer you up screens that made sense to you based upon the interactions that you had before. Maybe you were um, into positional players. Maybe you're into more of a one versus one, or you care about sacks, or you care about whatever the case is, They'll start feeding you more information around that. Um, what this resulted in is that they used social media no longer as just an informational tool. They use it as an engagement tool, right? So this is where my fan is living. Well, let's go see him there. So they created these interactive polls and quizzes and all these cool things like interactive micro games when there's ad breaks because the chances are that they're going to tune out and do something else when there's an ad break on or a break in the action. Let's give them something that potentially we could brand, right? So there's some sponsorship opportunities there. But how do we keep their eyeballs on my product? I don't want them going and seeing their other kind of secondary team in the halftime. I want them on my product, right? Create that content and I get their first party data from them because I understand how they're interacting with my brand. And then with the second screen experience, give them something that is differentiated to the things that they're having in terms of the overlays and that how can I use the second screen um, paradigm to drive further interaction to the brand. So I can then use it almost as a remote control for my digital experience. Here I can start deeply customizing my experience, even if it is my first time here. Um, and we take the time to do that as a Gen Zer once. If we don't get them to do that by the first time they're coming in, by the second, third, fourth, fifth time, if they are coming in, they're not going to give you the information because you kind of blew your shot there, right? When they come in, they'll they'll spend the time, they'll do the setup, they'll tell you their information because they believe they're getting value. And then you start customizing from there. This gave them a way to circumvent that, right? Because I can do in real time customizations based on this remote control type concept that we had for my digital experience. It gave me the opportunity to, to show content on here, which isn't shown anywhere, gave me content to show on my smart screen that I'm showing, my smart TV, or in a augmented um, or in a virtual reality setting. So how this resulted in, we got a 20% increase in this the app that they used, a 20% increase in the app subscription, it's a paid for app, and then 15% increase in average viewing time, right? So not only were more people signing up for the app, they were spending more time on it when they were there, which is a fantastic success for them. Very positive reception, they engaged more. Right, so targeted, the, we're able to target with more interactive ads, which means they stayed on that brand that paid for this ad. They stayed on that landing page longer because they're maybe doing a shooter, or maybe they're doing a, a little th a free throw, or a, can you uh, can you uh, uh, make a field goal thing? But they, it's all branded with that person. 
um, with that sponsor, they're going to stay there longer. Um, so it added more revenue to their ads. Um, the person stayed longer. And again, it prevented them from going to a competing um, content when I didn't have any action or when I had a break in the action. So hopefully you can see these two things really provided value for the fan, but it was bi-directional because they both gained first party data from me back to them. So when I come back, I have a better experience. So when I come back, you know, already know my preferences. So you're not going to start talking about something I don't care about because if I have a negative experience, I'm not that interested in carrying on with this because I don't like to be felt generic. I don't like to be felt like you're not really listening to me and I'm not getting anything unique. So how do we get all of this together? Right? So we've got the wonderful examples. We've got the segmentations. How do we bring it all together? If I had one word, technology. All right. So I really think it's on, on, on three pillars here. It's the rise and continued adoption of cloud computing to offer you the scale that you need in order to get the uh, computation, um, uh, compute storage and networking that you need. You have an ethical AI based tooling, as we're talking about, having something that is generative, having something that can provide you deep insights at machine speed, having something you can interact with um, that, that manages itself on a very ethical based uh, paradigm as it's being built and providing access not only to data analytics, but real time data analytics. That's what builds a uni unified fan experience platform. Now, this is something you can build. This is something you can buy. This is components you can build and buy. There are plenty of first and third party offerings out there, SaaS offerings, for example. Um, these things are the core tenets of getting a technology infrastructure in place that's going to allow you to enter into a paradigm where you can speak to your fans and meet them where they are. The key point here is that you have to ensure that your fan data is securely stored is securely processed, so when data is moved, it's done in a compliant fashion as to security regulatory uh, commitments, compliance regulatory uh, commitments, and protections, because the minute you break that, you're done. Right, The minute that you abuse the right that you have as the caretaker of my data as a fan, and it's leaked, or it is that some data hack has happened and my data is now exposed and is used for nefarious purposes, I now have to deal with all this rubbish that's happening because my email leaked or my credit card leaked. Or you've lost my trust. And it is darn near impossible to get that trust back. So building on a platform or purchasing a third-party solution that is built on the tenants of security first is table stakes. You cannot mess around with that at all because you will lose your fan for good. And then you have to have a strategy. Everything starts with a strategy, right? What do you want to do and how do you want to get there? How do you measure what success looks like? And there's various ways to do it. You don't have to do it on your own. There are wonderful people like Engage RM, like Microsoft, for example, that have done this and do this at scale for various clients that can help you get started, that can help you concentrate on the things that are quote unquote, low hanging fruit that will bring in easy revenue for you, right? No such thing as easy revenue. We'll bring in revenue faster for you versus taking off those meaty things right now that may take a couple of uh, steps or iterations to get there. Don't have to go it alone because you're not the first year. This is not the race to be first anymore. This is the race to meet the fan where they are and you always have to be on your toes. So I'm going to, um, hopefully a lot of you have, have been able to read the, the white paper that Engage RM uh, just released called a ticketing revolution. It is a it is a really good piece of uh, of data and a good uh, piece of writing. So well done to the Engage RM team. I wanted to end um, with a couple of of key points that I pulled out of it. That um, as a practitioner in the sports technology field, I felt were important to me that I could tell my clients about, that I could tell my industry about, and tell you folks about as well. So it is beyond a shadow of a doubt proven that personalization makes you more money. Right, um, a lot of money. Sometimes up to 25% of the research that Engage RM has done. So it isn't a nice to have now. It's table stakes. If you need to make more money with what you have now as a fan base, personalization is a very key tenant to getting there. Um, consumers expect personalization at this point. 
they do not don't treat me like everybody else. They expect personalization right now. Um, if you look at it, uh, what they did from 21 to 22, 40 percent, 45 percent to over 60 percent now in a year. Expect you to know enough about me to give me a, a personalized experience. If you don't, I'll go get it somewhere else. Um, a record number of ticket sales are happening, but actually live events are decreasing in number. How is that possible? Sports is the complete exception of that, right? Sports is increasing. I mean, we have the NFL, they put another game onto the schedule, right? We have Messi and, and into Miami doing a, a whirlwind tour going from South America, Hong Kong, et cetera. The, the events and the, and the uh, opportunities to see live sports are growing and increasing. We've got new teams coming on the USA. Casey Current, right? They're going to start kicking the ball around there. Super exciting. Um, and then data-driven personalization AI. That's what we've been talking about for the last 30 minutes, right? AI and deep analytics personalization is table stakes right now. And you have to have tools that can help you do that. AI is one of them. Real-time data is another one as well. You've got tools such as your CRM tool. We like to have our, our Dynamics tool, right? You have um, tools like your AI tools. We have our, our Microsoft Copilots. We like those. Open AI, there's Bard, there's Gemini, there's Llama. There's a bunch of them out there that you can go and use. But you can leverage these for targeted campaigns. You can leverage these for gaining that first-party data um, because the impact of personalized experience of customer behavior is critical for getting it right, but it's critical if you get it wrong. This last stat here is, is, is crazy, right? Gen Zers are more likely to leave you as a brand if they have a bad impersonal experience. They're most likely to go, I'm not coming back. Right? 49% will say, I'm no longer going to vote with my wallet for you because I think it's a disaster and how do you not know about me? So get on the train, right? And then um, this is pretty cool that the engaged um, RM folks have got. Um, Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, if, if you've ever been there, it's it's brilliant. If you ever get the opportunity to go to the stadium, it's it's a marvel of engineering. It's just absolutely magnificent. Um, they were able to increase their sales through the use of real-time data, right, to people in the venue per game to the tune of 800,000 pounds of revenue uplift just by food, drink, and, 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 and merchandising to people who are in the room already that would have been there anyway, but making use, good due diligence use of data, uplifted 800,000 pounds. There's nearly a million dollars worth of uplift because you're employing a data strategy. Staggering. So I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm happy to take some questions here. This is a quote by, by me. Um, I made it up. So one of the things that I really think that the, the paradigm shift around fan engagement is the embracing of cloud computing, AI, and analytics, right? But it's not just to revolutionize the fan experience across the generations that we've got. It's really to make every single moment in the future of sports memorable for everybody. Because everybody now, the fans have been elevated to a key member of the, of the sporting team they are also responsible for creating memorable moments now for everybody around them and their team. And that will continue to grow and will continue to get integrated with each other where everything we do as an organization, everything we do as a fan will come together and create these memorable experiences for me. And I'll have my memorable experiences tailored to me and you will have yours tailored to you. And I really think that we're seeing the, the, seeing the rapid adoption of that. So with that, I want to say thank you. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm happy to stay around and answer some questions for you. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. My data is there. You can uh, watch on YouTube or our podcast, and you can also uh, email me if you like.